the key is to allow the out breath to go all the way out. And then the in breath will take care of itself. I'm here today with Vijamala Birch. Vijamala is a founding member and key figurehead of Breathworks, which is a mindfulness training organization. They train uh, the public, but also teachers uh, in how to teach mindfulness. And a lot of their uh, techniques are based on mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Uh, but they have a really strong focus on pain and illness and, su and suffering and overcoming it using meditation as a tool. Uh, Vijamal is also the author of Mindfulness for Health with Dr. Danny Penman. Um, and that's that one book of the year in the, the medical British Medical Association's Book Awards, uh, the year it came out. And it's also one of the few books that's available on prescription from the NHS. Vijamala, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Can you remember the first time you meditated? I certainly can, yes. I was 25 years old. I was in a hospital bed in Auckland Hospital in New Zealand, where I come from. And I'd had major uh, spinal problems 10 years previously, major surgery. Um, my life had really been turned upside down. Mm. And then 10 years after the original injury and surgery, I found myself in hospital with lots of complications. And uh, I think the medical team didn't really know what to do with me. There wasn't anything that could be done at that point. I just had a really messed up back. And uh, so they sent the hospital chaplain to see me. I wasn't religious, but this very lovely, kind, gentle man came to my bed, took my hand, and he did a, a very short meditation practice with me. Mm. It was more of a visualization practice. He asked me to remember a time and a place where I'd been happy. So I took my mind to the Southern Alps of New Zealand, where I'd done a lot of climbing when I was, a, well, before my injuries, when I was 14, 13 and 14 and been ecstatically happy just in this magnificent beauty of the New Zealand mountains. So I took myself back to that. I think, I have no idea how long that meditation practice was. I would imagine it was maybe only 10 minutes, I don't know. And then he, he brought me out of the practice and I felt different. So I was the same girl lying in the same hospital bed, but my subjective experience had changed dramatically by what I'd done with my mind. So that awoke this tremendous curiosity. You know, mm. that uh, that was the, the, the first glimmerings mm. that my mind, I, I could possibly use my mind to help me manage my physical situation. So you'd, you'd ended up in that hospital bed um, when you were 25 years mm. old. Uh, and what happened after that? How did you go from that initial glimmering into well, where you are now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a, a quite remarkable and surprising journey. <clears throat> I felt completely lost and broken at that point. I'd, I'd been working in the film industry, lost my career, lost my financial stability, lost my health. And uh, there was another thing that happened during that hospital stay that had a very profound effect on me, where I found myself uh, in an intensive care neurosurgical ward mm -hmm. um, with... I th they didn't really know what was happening, but I was very, very sick. And uh, there was one night when I really thought I was going to lose my mind. This was, this was actually before the visualization practice. Um, I'd had a particular test that day, which meant I needed to sit up for 24 hours. And this was before the days of posh hospital beds that prop you up. And uh, this was way back in the 70s. And um, the pain was, it was just unbearable. I was in agony. And I really thought I couldn't do it. I really thought I cannot do this. And it was, you know, it was the middle of the night, lots of very, very sick people around me, proper dark night of the soul. So there I was in this hospital bed thinking, I can't do this, I'm gonna go crazy. I cannot get through till the morning. That was the kind of narrative, I cannot get through till the morning, it's unbearable. And then another part of me was saying, but you have to. So I had this inner dialogue between a part of me that was saying, I can't. I cannot do this. And another part of me saying, but you have to, I can't, you have to, I can't, you have to. Um, I would say it's the most, it, it's probably the most intense experience of my whole life. And then at a certain point, another voice came in from nowhere. I mean, it was 
I still don't understand it. I have no idea where this voice came from. And this voice said to me very clearly, you don't have to get through till the morning. You just have to live this moment and this one and this one and this one and this one. And the part of me that was that was so tormented kind of relaxed and, and I thought, yes, I can do this. I can live just this moment. And I and and time kind of unraveled my whole concept of time, you know, this mm. this this eternity until the morning kind of collapsed. Uh, in in my awareness. It, 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 it was a bit like a house of cards collapsing maybe and there was just space there. Mm. And uh, so, of course, I had to get through till the morning. And uh, I was completely changed by that. You know, I've, I often say that that night is the axis upon which my life has turned because I directly experienced the fact that we ever only live life one moment at a time. Mm. It wasn't head learning. It wasn't something I read in a book. It came from nowhere. Mm. I had no awareness of mindfulness or anything at that point. But I knew that... The key to life is to be present. I knew that very, very deeply and viscerally. So that when I came out of the hospital, I'd had these experiences of it, life ever only happens one moment at a time. Mm. And the agony that we experience so often about projecting into the future or indeed regrets about the past. And then the chaplain had given me that gift of awareness that I could train my mind. What I did with my awareness changed my subjective experience. Um, and really my life, my life just totally changed. I, I never went back to my job, which was a, a totally inappropriate job. Somebody with a really bad back, just sitting as a film editor for hours a day. And I wasn't well enough. And I was completely obsessed with the mind, with mm. consciousness. Because in a way, with that experience in the night, like time collapsed and space collapsed. Like what is time? What is space? What is consciousness? They became my really, really big questions. I was in my 20s. It's a, it's a time of life where, I mean, I think I am quite an intense person anyway, but you've got that kind of hunger to mm. know when mm. you're in your 20s. So I read as much as I could, had a fantastic social worker, and I said to her, I really want to learn to meditate. So she got me tapes, these old cassette tapes from the library. Mm. I mean, I didn't know anybody that meditated. It was completely outside my um, experience. Meditation wasn't popular then. Mm. Um, eventually I made my way to a yoga class to help me rebuild was, my body. Was yoga popular then? Was it, or was no, that still the no, game? No, nobody, yeah. nobody did these things apart yeah. from my friend Warwick. I had this friend Warwick. And every now and then he'd say to me, hey, I'm doing something, do you want to come? And yeah. I'd say, yeah, great, I'll try anything. So he said, I'm going on a yoga weekend. Do you want to come? So I, I went to this ashram. It kept very, very intense. Oh, my God. You know, getting up at five And this in the is with all your back. With all my back yeah, problems. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's quite funny, that story. So I, I turned up there and um, we had to do, I think, an hour's yoga before breakfast. And I was stiff as a plank. Mm. You know. and, uh, but, of course, you know, I threw myself in trying to give it a go. And then later on, the teacher came and found me and he said, uh, you do seem to be rather stiff. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I've got a few spine. He said, oh, OK. And, you know, gave me some adaptive poses. But again, that was the beginning because at the yoga place, it was not only uh, Hatha yoga, but it was mm. meditation. Mm. So then I started going to the city, city centre classes several times a week. I was off work. I had time, you see, because that's the other interesting thing, the way my life has unfolded is, um, you know, if I'd had a normal life and was in a career or I had children, I'd just be really, really busy. Mm. But I was basically bedridden, more or less, for months, you know, gradually rehabilitating myself with swimming and yoga and so on. So I had these hours and hours and hours lying on my bed look at the, looking at the ceiling, examining my mind, mm. examining consciousness, examining awareness, teaching myself how to think, you know, taking a topic and thinking it through right to the very end. Um, but something much more mysterious. So who am I? What is life? What is consciousness? What is this pain? How do I relate to this pain? So I did all that and eventually I came across uh, a Warwick again, said to me, I'm going on a Buddhist weekend. Do you want to come? So I said, fine, yeah, I'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to, on this Buddhist weekend um, with what was the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order and it's been renamed as the Triratna Buddhist Order. 
are beautiful plays on the shores of Auckland Harbour. Very, very nice people. Very friendly. Um, people who are that at ease with themselves. Mm -hmm. And I found that very, very attractive. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. If you follow this, this curiosity about consciousness and who am I and what is life, maybe you end up like that. You mm -hmm. end up comfortable in your own skin mm -hmm. and you end up uh, more fully who you are, as it were. Yeah, so that's really interesting. You have almost the carrot and the stick. Uh, you've got the stick of fearing this future, how am I going to get through this? But then you've also got this the carrot of, uh, oh, I, I'll become more comfortable myself if I can harness some of this thinking. That's right, yes. So, and, you know, at that point it was all very intuitive. I didn't really understand what was going on, but there was a a kind of recognition of something in these people that I met where somehow they disentangled themselves from, you know, worrying about the future, regretting the past and not being present. And they'd landed kind of in their bodies, in their lives. And what was really gorgeous is that they were lighthearted. Mm. And uh, that's been one of the surprising outcomes for me of a lifetime, already an adult life, my adult life of, um, being curious about the mind, being curious about consciousness is that, and even, you know, I have a lot of pain and I teach a lot of people with pain, but what I see again and again and again is we laugh, mm. we take things less seriously in a way you take, in a way you take life more seriously as being significant, but you take things less seriously in terms of getting all tangled up with the crazy things that we worry about. Yeah, so that was amazing meeting them. And, and really, I, I felt then, oh, yeah, this, this will be what I do. Mm. I felt then, bec partly because of it, it was so attractive seeing these people. I mean, they were, and they were all very, very different. Mm. You know, that it's like they'd all become more and more who they truly were. So it wasn't like you got a homogenous type of person and they were all the same. Far from it. And some of them were proper characters. As we say in New Zealand, oh, he's a character <laughs> or she's a character. So they were proper characters, but this kind of at easeness with themselves. And I thought, yes, that's what I, I trust this. That was a kind of compass. Um, and eventually I moved to, the, to Britain, to, to England, to live in a Buddhist retreat center for women in Shropshire. And I lived there for five years. So that was also quite intense. <laughs> Mm. I sort of hurled myself from one side of the world to the other with this very, very bad back. Um, lived in this retreat center uh, with between 10 and 12 other women, varied at different times. And uh, that was a really good thing to do. I think I, again, I knew I need proper training. I need in-depth training. I need, I need to intensively practice, partly because I, I knew I had a lot to work with. You know, I had all my, my, my pain and my spinal injuries to work with and also just my own mind, you know. It was, it was an insecure, quite fearful mind. Um, those are my tendencies, I would say, some of my tendencies. So I went on a lot of intensive meditation retreats, you know, 10 days, weeks. I do maybe 10 a year, something like that. And, and I live with these very, very kind people. So I kind of, I sort of unraveled. <laughs> <laughs> to some extent during that time, you know, I, I had a lot of holding in my body. But being in an environment of kindness, I learned how to release mm. some of those holding patterns. And of course, when one unravels, um, you know, it's not always comfortable. And I had times where my back was, ah, uh, I suppose as it became less kind of contracted, then well, a, a good image is if you're carrying around a bag of shopping, mm. you know, a really heavy bag of shopping like this, your hand doesn't really hurt. But when you put down the bag of shopping, what does your yeah. hand feel like? You can't even move it. <laughs> exactly. And then the sort of ache comes in. So I think I was doing a lot of releasing, a lot of, a lot of releasing of trauma as well. Uh, and probably I needed to be in a place like that. Mm. I needed to be somewhere very safe, very kind. Um, very clear values, you know, very, very sh shared ethical values that I shared with these women. So I stayed there for five years, um, did a lot of work on myself, um, you know, good work and sometimes painful work, necessary work. 
then it came time to leave. I think with these kind of situations that you do it for so long and then it's time to move on. And eventually I, um, I got to a point where I, I was very interested to see had I learned anything that would be of use to others who are also living with you know, devastating situations of one sort or another, or chronic health problem, chronic pain, stress, whatever it might be, you know, from the really catastrophic end right through to just everyday discomfort. And uh, in 2000, I started running courses uh, here in the Manchester Buddhist Centre, uh, very much as an experiment. You know, did I have anything to offer? Could I do it physically? And would it be of benefit to others? And it was, it was just wonderful right from the start. You know, I, put, I put an ad in the Manchester Evening News um, saying I was running these courses, completely inundated with interest with, within a few days. So we, was it specifically for pain at this point? It was, yeah, yeah for pain and illness. And uh, I got a small grant from the government so the courses could be free at that point. And uh, yeah, I found it wonderful that so many people were interested and also a little bit saddening. I didn't realise there were so many people mm. in the world who had uh, chronic pain. I've now come, uh, I've now learned it's about one in five in the developed world, about one in three living with uh, long-term health conditions of one sort or another. Yeah, so it's about one in four with mental health problems. So it's an epidemic. So I, I realised that, I learned that. Ran the courses that first year, very successful. Um, you know, it's very uh, unformed at that point. You know, I've now got a very highly crafted program after 20 years, but at that point it was all very exper experimental. I was drawing on my own experience, drawing on the work of John Kabat-Zinn, who founded Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, drawing on some CBT stuff that I'd learned myself around pacing. Still seem to work, which is interesting, isn't it? Mm. That even at that point when it was pretty raw and <laughs> not very formed, it was effective. The following year, I had more major surgery on my spine, had another year off. And then the following year, 2003, I was very fortunate and I was joined by two colleagues, <clears throat> two very experienced meditators who were friends of mine who wanted to help me with this vision that I had. And we formed a company and called it Breathworks. And Mm. Mm. So things unfolded. And the rest yeah. is history. The rest is history. Yeah. So we've talked, we've meant, we've touched a little bit on pain, which is something that I'm really like to get into, really, in terms of how can this help you? Can it can it stop me from feeling pain? How does that help with pain? How does meditation yeah. help with yeah. pain? Yeah, that's a really great question because, of course, it's it's pretty counterintuitive. Yeah. Because meditation is awareness which includes awareness of the body. And if you've got pain in your body, you may well quite reasonably think, well, that's the last thing I want to be aware of. I would have thought that years ago. <clears throat> so it's very counterintuitive. Um, but what we do is we, we break this experience that we describe as pain mm -hmm. into two components that we call primary and secondary suffering. And the primary suffering is the basic unpleasant sensations in the body. That's a given. So right now I've got unpleasant sensations in my lower back. I've got unpleasant sensations in my legs and feet. Yeah. So that's the primary uh, suffering. If I'm not aware and I'm habitually pushing that pain away, consciously or unconsciously, thinking I don't want that, which is totally understandable. But if one's not aware, then is a, a subtle or gross kind of pushing away of that experience which we describe as resistance. So then you've got the unpleasant sensations plus resistance. And th the way we can think of resistance is like a tight fist. So there's the, the pain, then this is kind of, I don't want that. Mm. And that will manifest mentally as, um, uh, I don't want that thoughts, or it might be catastrophizing thoughts. I can't bear it, it's gonna go on forever. Why me, poor me, it's not fair, those kind of thoughts. Emotionally, it might be depression, fear, anxiety. And of course, physically, it's going to be secondary tension. So if I've got pain, and then I'm contracting around that pain, if I do that now, straight away my pain gets worse. Mm. So then you've got primary plus resistance plus all the secondary suffering. And so this, this, this thing we describe as pain is in fact this complex amalgamation of all those factors 
and it's just horrible it's horrible so you got these unpleasant sensations resistance i don't want this i hate this it's not fair depression anxiety fear and that whole mass is what we call pain mm. so with awareness we begin to unravel all that unpack all that we turn towards what's actually happening right now so if i was say say i was lost in the secondary so right now say i was um you know i could be th sitting here thinking oh my god my pain's really terrible i can't bear it how am i going to get through this interview straight away i'm holding my breath i'm contracting you see my pulling up on my body my pain's getting worse mm -hmm. thoughts start to get worse yeah because the mind's hearing that in the body exactly like hearing all that secondary tension exactly preparing you for yeah that. and i'm getting all kinds of hormones and then i start getting thoughts of why did i ever agree to do this with tom this is a crazy <laughs> idea and then my confidence starts to disappear yeah like i know i can't do these things why do i do these things i'm really stupid mm -hmm. and then i get into collapsing or mm -hmm. i get frightened yeah with awareness i notice all that I'm, a, I'm actually not having any of those thoughts. Okay, cool. But say I was having those thoughts. <laughs> it's quite simple. You just drop back. You just... Oh, I'm breathing. I breathe out. <sighs> Soften. Mm. The mind calms. Mm. And I'm just left with the unpleasant sensations. Yeah. And the great thing is the, when you do this, you realise that the unpleasant sensations are often much more localised than you think. So it's just my lower back. And my legs and my feet at the moment. A little bit of pain in my hands. Now, if I'm really contracting against it and hating it and resisting it, the story in my mind is my back is killing me. That might be the story. And I think it's my whole back and it's all a complete disaster. Actually, when I come closer, my upper back feels completely fine at the moment. Mm. My middle back's fine. So you, paradoxically, by examining what's actually happening, mm. almost always it's not nearly as bad as you think it is. Mm. So by focusing more deeply on the on the primary source of my pain, instead of ignoring it, burying it, uh, and, and all the other things we do to resist it, we kind of, we're able to accept it. This is my understanding of what yeah. you're saying. We're able to accept it. And then all of the other things that we've built on top of it, all of that emotional, physical resistance, we have more control over it that that's that's right yeah, yeah. yeah and very often it just kind of dissolves away mm. again it's like the house of cards collapsing it's got the whole house of cards of the with all the kind of rumination and worry and fear and breath holding and tension and then when you knock a house of cards away what are you left with you just left with space mm. and yet the house of cards looks real doesn't it but you you, you just take yeah, out a take card out the, the whole thing card, just basically. collapses yeah. yeah and you're just left with space mm. And then the next point, this is very, very important and goes right back to my hospital experience, is if you come, you turn back to what's the basic experience, what's the primary experience, you know, I've got these sensations in my lower back, and you examine those, you realise that they're changing all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's not a thing, you know, we describe pain as if it's a noun, as if it's a thing. It's not a thing, it's an experience. And then when you come really close to it, you, that's when you really taste directly oh i'm only experiencing this one moment at a time and it's very bearable mm -hmm. i can be here i can be engaged i can be connected i can be present with you and the pain is part of that but it's not everything and it's fluid and it's changing and no two moments of pain are exactly the same just like the breath is flowing you realize your thoughts are flowing sensations are flowing and you ever only experience it one moment at a time we touched briefly there previously on the on the pacing and the CBT, and that brings me to something else to talk about in your book, which is this boom and bust cycle. And I know from your story there that you may have been a big boomer at the beginning and a big your, buster. Yeah, and a big and there was this huge bust. <laughs> yes. uh, can you talk a little bit about what what is boom and bust yeah. cycle? Yeah. So the boom and bust cycle is sometimes called the overactivity underactivity cycle. Very common to people with uh, any compromised energy, I would say. So if you've got a health condition where you've got fatigue, um, you know, you, you just haven't got Duracell batteries running you dawn till dusk, but it's like um, 
you haven't got the same capacity that you might have when you were young and healthy. So it's also true for people with chronic fatigue syndrome, those kind of things. And what happens is that uh, when you feel good, you really go for it. And then the next day you wake up and you're knackered and maybe your pain's flaring because you've really overdone it the day before. So then you bust and maybe, maybe you go to bed. Maybe you go to bed for an hour, a day, weeks, months. Yeah. In my own, <laughs> you're quite right, in my own experience, um, I'm naturally quite a driven character. Um, when I first had my injuries, I didn't accept it at all. I couldn't accept I was 18, 17, 18 years old. It was too devastating. Um, you know, my life went from being incredibly physically active. I was very sporty. Mm -hmm. I loved tramping, as we call hill walking. In okay. New we call it tramping, <laughs> which it probably is more tramping yeah. in the mountains. I loved that. I was super fit. And uh, I wanted to work as a wildlife officer for my career, just out in the wilderness all the time. And suddenly all that fell away. I couldn't do any of that. So it was pretty devastating. So the way I coped with that uh, initially was just to pretend it hadn't happened. <laughs> and I think that's very common. Mm. I think it's one of the ways that human beings uh, deal, or you could say don't deal with devastation, is we just, we just soldier on as if it's not happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I got a job in film and I just completely overdid it. I pushed myself every day to run away from my direct experience. So it's the complete opposite of everything I've been describing. Yeah. The first 10 years of my injury really, up until I was 25 and had the experiences I mentioned earlier, was just complete denial. So running, 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 running. So I would never feel anything. So that's massive booming, just overdoing all the time. And then of course, uh, I ended up in hospital and then the whole thing came tumbling down and I had months and months and months in bed. Yeah. So I'm a huge boomer and buster. So that's the bust. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the bust. Um, but the pattern, I think you can do it on a massive scale like I did. Mm. And I've, I've had this cycle over my adult life of gradually overdoing it more and then ending up with mm. a crisis, um, which actually I haven't had since 1997. Wow. That's my last crisis which is 12 years, so that's really encouraging. Although, okay. fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> and so what can we do about that cycle? Is there a, is there a hack? What's yes, there? there is, yeah. So uh, what I was going on to say is we can either do it on a big scale, but actually we can even do it on a micro scale in moments where you might have something that's a bit uncomfortable and you think, oh, okay, I'm just gonna keep going, keep going, keep going. And then it's like, oh, I can't bear this, it's all too much. So I think we're all kind of oscillating between mm pushing ourselves and collapsing, pushing ourselves and collapsing. And the hack is to be aware of it, mm. to, to become, to, to even know that you're doing it. So in our courses, we often say, who here has got a tendency to overdo it on a good day and then have a bit of a crash? And almost everybody puts their hands up, yeah? And to be honest, I'm slightly suspicious of the people that don't put their hands up. Yeah. <laughs> they might just not be aware of it. <laughs> exactly, I think, yeah. wow, either you're really yeah. amazing yeah. or you're just not that. And is that something, haven't quite honed when you say it it's yet. people on your courses, is it something that people with chronic pain tend to do? Is, is that what you, yes. or is it just everybody? Or is well, it, I think everybody does it, yeah. but I think if you're really healthy, you can get away with it. Mm. If you're really mm. healthy, you know, you, and you overdo it, generally speaking, you know, you have a good night's sleep and you wake up the next day and you, you might be a bit tired, but mm. you've got the capacity, you've got the reserves. But I think any situation where your reserves are compromised, through some kind of health condition, then you don't get away with it. Mm. Um, so what I did, and I've developed this as part of our program, it's, it's very detailed and specific, where you keep a diary for seven days. Every single activity, how long you did it for, and what was your pain at the end, yeah? And then after seven days, you analyze that, all the activities that made your pain worse and how long you did them for, all the activities that made no difference and all the activities that eased it. Mm. Yeah. So that's almost like mindful awareness, but applied to your life. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And then what is quite specific, what we then teach, but to, to put it very simply, you, you take a, uh, straight away you'll see on the, on the column of all the things that made your pain worse, you'll see a pattern. So I saw it was sitting. So sitting made my pain worse and lying down made it better. Now I knew that on some level, but seeing it in black and white was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then I, I started using a timer. 
So now if I'm working at my computer, um, doing anything that involves sitting, mm. after 23 minutes, timer goes off and I'll stand up and have a stretch, mm -hmm. maybe lie down, mm -hmm. maybe potter about. Yeah. And that has massively changed my life. That's changed my life more than meditation, mm -hmm. which I always think is a kind of, what's well, a very strong thing to say. But what I used to do, and again, I think this is common human behavior, I would sit until I couldn't sit anymore. I'd sit until I was in agony. So if I was working at my computer, I'd be you know, getting really, really tense, sweating, very compromised breathing. And then eventually I'd be in such agony that I'd peel off and be completely wiped out for the rest of the day. Yeah. So that's the pattern. And I think again, I don't quite know why we do this as human beings, mm. but we like to finish what we start. So on our courses, it might be the people doing all the washing up is very tiring. But the idea that you break the washing up and do it in small chunks, that's very foreign to us as human beings, or the housework or shopping. You go to the supermarket and do a massive shop when you could do a little shop every day. So it's, it's, it's working out what are your trigger activities and then how can you do those in a more sustainable, balanced way. Mm. And, and that sort of brings me on to the next thing, which is compassion and self-compassion, because uh, I know that one of the things that is different about Breathworks is a focus on kindness, mm -hmm. um, which I think is very difficult for, for most people to, to see themselves in a kind mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder what, what role do you think that has in meditation and, well, health in general, really? Yeah, I think it's absolutely essential. So on the Breathworks program, half of it's awareness training and half of it's kindness or compassion training. Um, and the, the image we use is to have the attitude to one's own pain that you would naturally have to a loved one who was hurting. You know, if, you, if your child falls over, it's so natural to scoop that child up and soothe it mm. or a lover. And yet we're so harsh towards ourselves. So it's very important to me that the awareness training, it's not a cool, aloof kind of clinical awareness but it's a warm, emotionally engaged, kind, tender awareness. I think tender is a very beautiful word. So for me to bring the attitude to my back pain that I would naturally have if you were hurting. You know, mm. I say, oh, Tom, you know, that's really tough. And mm. is there anything I can do to help? And, and yet we can be so harsh and dismissive towards ourselves. And I, I think with pain, it is just very, very hard. So how can we bring a kind of soothing, tender, gentle attitude? Mm. Uh, Self-soothing, very, very important. And uh, there's lots of evidence that loving kindness meditation practices are good for our health. Yeah, well, I, that's interesting you say that because I think it's something I'm learning more and more about recently where, where we're feeling kindness to other people through meditation or even just mm. being kind. Um, it releases oxytocin and that's really, really good for you. And it's the opposite of all those sort of striving and, and stress states that we were talking about just then. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the more we can do it, the better, I guess. That's right, yeah. And, and the evolutionary psychologists, um, one of the things they've identified, which I think is very interesting, is that we are fundamentally social beings, creatures, we're social creatures. If you go right back to hunter-gatherer times, um, one of the skills that we learned was to work together. And the lone rangers, they died out. And so in, in our DNA is the people that learn to work together. We're very vulnerable creatures as a species, comparing to elephants and lions and tigers and so on. You know, we're very, very fragile. And one of the reasons why we've risen to the top of the food chain is because we learned to cooperate. Now you might think, you know, we're not that good at that if you look at the state of the world. <laughs> But it's in our biology yeah. to cooperate. And when we do that, it releases all kinds of healing hormones. And we can recreate some of that in uh, things like loving kindness meditation, where we actively cultivate uh, care and love for somebody that we already feel yeah. connected with, maybe someone feel, we feel disconnected with. So it's almost like a lot of the, a lot of the health things we're doing now that we weren't doing 20 years ago, even just much healthier diets and exercise. They're almost attempts to live closer to how we lived as 
in our evolutionary environment. And it's almost like we're lacking that connection as well in our modern world. So for the more we can stimulate that, that's also good for our health. Definitely. We need a diet yeah. of kind of kindness and connection as well. A diet of kindness and connection. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting with social media that I heard this brilliant phrase, which is we're so connected, we're disconnected, which is yeah, very, very good. And yet it's interesting that what is it that what is the longing behind, you know, connecting on social media? Yeah, it goes wrong and we end up with comparison and feeling inadequate and jealous and all sorts of other things. But I think there is something innate about we, we long for connection. In fact, mm. I, my own sense is that's one of the deepest human drives mm. is longing to connect. And that's also connecting with ourselves. In the modern world, I think we're mm. quite disconnected from mm. ourselves. And I think meditation, mindfulness, uh, compassion meditations is just such a great way just to drop in. Stop, drop in, come home, come home, breathe, soften, breathe, soften, breathe, soften. That's basically, I think, mm. I'm increasingly realizing that's what it's all about, yeah. breathing and softening and presence. Be present, breathe, soften, breathe, soften, presence. And you really can't go wrong with that. Mm. You mentioned how things have changed since you first started in the 90s and it was very experimental and you were kind of a frontiersman of, <laughs> of uh, training people in this. Um, and it, things have drastically moved on since then and the study has been done on the efficacy of, of what you're doing with Breathworks mm. by uh, different universities and they've shown it has massive impact on people, um, especially people with chronic conditions. Mm. Uh, and I wonder, do you think it's still developing? Do you think in another 10 years you've added new things and is it is it still alive in that sense or is it, is it like you've you've cut away the sculpture and, and the, you've cut away the stone and the sculpture's there and it's finished is it still happening is it still changing yeah no that's a very very good question and i'm happy to say it's still changing it's not a, it's a I don't think it'll ever be set in stone yeah um it's changing in a number of ways um in some ways it's simplifying you know, the more I do this work, the more simple it becomes. And I think I've just described it quite accurately for myself. You know, mm. presence, breathing, breathing. softening. <laughs> and there's all kinds of ways. There we... is more to that on the course. Though, yeah, we you... sort of unpack that in a number of different ways. And it's a very, it's a very carefully crafted program. So in a way, that's not changing. Mm. Um, how we deliver it is continually evolving. Uh, one of my complete passions is accessibility. You know, how do we um, make it as available as possible to as many people globally? Um, so we're developing a whole new internet delivery um, modality at the moment using a, what's called a virtual learning environment, mm -hmm. um, which is very, very exciting. I'm involved in apps, you know, things like I've done 10 day course on an app called Insight Timer. Now, 10 years ago, I would have been very skeptical about that. Mm. 15 minutes a day for 10 days, I would have said, that's, that's so lightweight. And I would have been quite snobby about it, probably. Mm. I did it, and it's been rolled out to thousands of people globally, and I'm getting amazing feedback. So it's changing people who yeah. you'll never meet. I know, never, yeah. And yeah, so I found that very interesting, you know, that I, it's very important to remain humble and open and learning. Yeah. So I've learned from people that actually 10 minute, uh, 15 minutes for 10 days, that will give people something quite substantial. It won't give them the same as a full eight week program. It won't give them the same as, you know, going on a week's intensive meditation retreat or practicing for 20 years, but it's a start. Mm. And it does seem to be life changing. So I'm continually looking at um, delivery methods. My, my vision, the phrase is, how do you reach the hard to reach people? Mm. Yeah, so I've written books. Well, okay, lots of people don't read books. Lots of people do read books, which is great, but how do you reach the people that don't read books? Um, because in my heart, I sense like this, so many people that one could call the hard to reach group that would really, really benefit from it. Mm. You know, there's a program that one of our teachers is now doing in East London amongst a community of low literacy, an immigrant community. And that's very, very inspiring for me. Again, amazing feedback. And she's going into that community She's changed the course, chunked it down to five weeks, make it more manageable. She's got funding now from the council, local council. So I'm very excited by those kind of innovations. So mm. it's, a, it's a bit like we need to keep the gold standard there. Mm -hmm. You know, the eight week program is 
that's not changing because I think that is really developed. So keep the gold standard and then keep on devising different ways of delivering that. Mm. Another area that um, is developing for myself and my thinking, the program so far has been a mindfulness program. So the Mindfulness of Health program, eight weeks, and I'm teaching people basically how to work with their minds. There's some mindful movement, which is of course very important as well. But if I look at my own journey, and uh, and I'm, I've been reading around this, it's obvious to me that mindfulness, mindfulness on its own was not enough. So my, my life has changed beyond recognition from even 10 years ago. You know, my, my pain's better, quality of life's better. Mindfulness has been the foundation, like learning that I can choose what I do with my awareness and I'm not a victim of my mind. But then I've also, um, I look after my diet. I get aerobic exercise and I, and I do stretches. Um, I have a routine in my life. I go to bed roughly the same time. I try to look, look after my sleep. So I'm now realizing that mindfulness is the foundation, but then we also need to look at um, exercise, diet, sleep, and also getting into nature. Yeah. So I've just come up with an acronym for that. Mm -hmm. MENDS. M-E-N-D-S. Oh, wow. So this okay. mends your life. Good. It's good, isn't it? So, so it's mindfulness, exercise, diet. nature, diet, sleep. Ah, I like it. So this yeah. mends your life. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> you had it here first. <laughs> and I think that um, I want to do more work around that, more writing around that, that, that mindfulness is a foundation, but um, if you've still got a really rubbish diet mm. and you're staying up all night and you're not getting any exercise, you're not going to get anything like the same benefit that you could. Yeah, and, and mindfulness is a foundation for being aware of the rest of those. Exactly. The immediate impact they're having, the long-term impact that yeah. they're having. Yeah, and then mindfulness gives you the ability to actually have some discipline. Because mm. it's a training. Because, yeah. of course, if you've got the habit of staying up really, really late, and then you make a decision, actually, it'd be really good if I went to bed at 10 or 11 or whatever. There's going to be, you know, lots of unhelpful habits in there. Mm. You know, you get to 10 or 11, you think, oh, I'll just watch another box set. So mindfulness gives you that kind of discipline to think, no, actually, I'm just going to go to bed. So you're no longer so, so much a victim of your habitual mm. compulsions. So that leads me on to my last question, which I'm asking everybody that I'm speaking to, which is, and this might be quite hard given how holistic your view is, if um, people watching us can do one thing today that would improve their well-being tomorrow, what would you have them do? Good, okay, so uh, I've got this little slogan. Yeah. When in doubt, breathe out. Yeah, so my, my, my observation is most people hold their breath most of the time. This kind of, mm. I'm, gonna, I'm exaggerating it there, mm. but this mm. is this is kind of mm. slightly rabbit in the headlights approach to life that we have. I think particularly in the modern world, we're hyper stimulated, so much to do, even just, you know, getting through a city, we've got to be a bit on guard the whole time. And as soon as we do that, we'll be holding our breath. And then as soon as we hold our breath, we've got all the secondary stuff I talked about earlier. So we're living a life and that's not great. So the, the, the key is to allow the out breath to go all the way out. And then the in breath will take care of itself. So. Mm. Just. You can do that sitting in the car, you can do it standing in the queue at the supermarket, you can do it sitting at your computer. Take those moments when you notice you're you know, getting caught and getting heady, caught up in worries and so on, come into the body, drop into gravity. That's another thing. Okay, I'm allowed two things. <laughs> so when in doubt, breathe out yeah. and rest in gravity. If you Which do you can do just things. after you breathe out. So you exactly. can count that as one. Yeah, well, you, 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 yeah. as soon as you, if you really get the out breath all the way out, you will be resting at gravity. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. as soon as you tense against gravity, you're holding your breath again. Mm. So Jamala. those are your friends, breath and gravity. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, it's been an absolute pleasure. Wonderful thank you. to have you. Thanks for watching, guys. As always, I will leave uh, links to the books that we've been talking about in the comments below. Um, and you can join me next time where I'll be talking to... Uh, Roland McCrady, the lead researcher at the HeartMath Institute in California, um, where they're looking at how rhythmic breathing brings your heart uh, and all of the different 
biorhythms in your body into synchrony and how that affects your emotions and your relationships to other people. Um, so yeah, look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for watching. Thank you.